the thing about mental health is everyone's different and it's it's interesting you say and you may well be right that, that the fact you introduced at 28 you know may have been uh, you know a, a helpful factor in, in not developing any sort of you know mental health concerns for me you know i played at, i was 20 21 when i first played for england uh, first cap against against new zealand uh, but for me, I played for England from 93 to 2003. So literally I did 10 years. And every year, you know, I faced adversity, uh, whether it be adversity in whether I'd be doing my uh, uh, law final exams when I was first played for England <coughs> at university, um, but also sort of, you know, internally. And I think everyone's different. And I, th and I think you strike me as a sort of person who probably wouldn't be too hard on yourself or probably would be, you know, measured in your thinking. Um, and, and, I, and I came across quite a few players in my career who were like that, who could sort of put everything in perspective. But everyone, everyone's very different. And, and I don't know whether I would have suffered if I went on to be a lawyer uh, and worked in the city and whether I would have had mental health problems anyway, irrespective of the fact that I didn't do that and I went into rugby. But... In the rugby sense, you know, why do I think that I struggle later on? And I'll, I'll get, get into a bit more detail what I struggled with. Um, I think that every year I was under pressure, obviously, having played for England at 21. Every year I, you know, obviously wanted to keep playing for England. And I was, I was battling with myself all of the time about how well I was doing. I was very hard on myself. And I think every sportsman has that. Everyone's a sportsman. I would go out, score two tries, get man of the match, and be disappointed I missed the tackle. Yeah. And I think you, that, you just want the perfect performance, don't you? Yeah, yeah. No, you're striving for that. That's right. And um, and I think um, I suppose also when I was in competition, whether it be Dowie Morris, Andy Gomesall, Matt Dawson, Austin Healy, or whatever. Now over the years, you know, you get in, you play, you think, have I done well enough? You play quite well. And, and then you obviously strive to get better and strive to get better. And the things, the adversity that comes are things like that you can't control. So, you know, I remember playing, you know, probably playing some of my best ever rugby. And then suddenly I, I did my knee and I was out for sort of three months and then I was back in. And then I had to fight again to be, get back in the team. I get back in the team with England and then suddenly um, I'd lose a bit of form and then I'd get dropped. And then I'd have that psychological sort of, being hard on myself I need to do better I need to work harder I, and then there was also sometimes the injustices so say the Lions tour in 97 I was playing for England at the time Matt Dawson was wasn't in the squad with England uh, I, I believe I was the number one and um, you know he got selected <clears throat> and I didn't and I, I found that quite hard um, and I always found also throughout my career you know I would have I'd go two steps forward you know three steps back and all the time, this pressure builds up. And what, what happened to me is probably different to, I would say, quite a few players. Um, I don't, I don't, uh, I, I know of one or two players who suffered with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. I think a lot of sportsmen have this sort of tendency to lean to, to have these sort of problems. But I started getting into rituals. It sounds a bit weird. I used to get into these rituals about going to bed. And I'd go to bed and I would think I need, I read somewhere you need eight hours sleep to have optimal performance. So I used to try and get into these routines of going to bed at a certain time and waking up at a certain time. And I started to try to control it. And once you start to try to control your sleep, uh, <laughs> start, got, you got no yeah, no, it's got no the reverse the effect. Thing, and the worst thing is I'd be roomy with someone like a forward who'd be snoring. So what yeah. I used to do is I used to leave the room and go to the physio's room and try and sleep in there thinking I need to get my eight hours sleep. And then what happened is, this is the worst part, is I would go to the toilet, go for a pee, and then I'd go back in bed and I'd go, right, I've been for a pee, now I can sleep. And then I'd go, I need the toilet again. So I'd go back out, I'd go to the toilet, I'd come back in, and then I'd go, right, I'm going to go to sleep now. And then I'd go, I need the toilet again. So I go again. And so it got to the point where I was going to the toilet about 180 times in the night. Okay. So I wouldn't sleep. So then I started taking sleeping tablets. <clears throat> and once you get sleeping tablets, it's quite addictive. Yeah. So I would think I need a sleeping tablet to sleep. So then I was training and playing on four hours sleep. And then with all of that, suddenly going to the toilet became literally on my mind 
all day, every day for about three or four years. Even in the, even when I was playing for England, uh, the this, this is the night. This is the night before a game. This isn't every single day, night before. No, no. No, 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 no. So what happened was it started out the night before a game and then suddenly it went into every, every single time day. You tra- every time you're training the next day or, or every all, single night? All day, every day, every single night for about four years. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, and, and the worst part of it was, I, well, I thought I was going mad. I mean, I'd be in a team meeting about a big game against you guys. What do, you, what do, what do your wife think of this? Was she, was oh, she aware well, she, of it? Did she bring this up yeah, at the time? Yeah, yeah. She was like, you need help. And I was too embarrassed. I was like, yeah. well, what, what do I do? Do I go to the doctor so I keep going to the toilet? I didn't know yeah, what When was this? Is this sort of like late 90s? Oh, this is, you know, this is like 2000. 2001, yeah. 2002. And yeah. then um, I got help. And then I, I saw a psychologist. And then I saw a psychiatrist. And then at the same time, I was getting all these little rushes of adrenaline. You know, before a game where you get that adrenaline rush? Yeah. I was getting that during the day randomly. And I was like, wow, that's like a proper adrenaline yeah. rush. And when you add it all together, I was pretty sick. I wasn't very well. And then I went and saw a psychiatrist and they said, well, you've got anxiety and you've got uh, a severe case of OCD, um, which is affecting your everyday life. So, you know, I was managing on two, three hours sleep a night. I was training and then I was thinking about this all the time. But the worst part was, you know, things like, um, you know, my, my son would be born and, and whilst I'd have the delight of my son being born, for example, you know, I would spend all my time thinking about going to the toilet. I know it sounds really mad, doesn't it? It sounds really weird. And something's seriously wrong then. So I got help and it, it took a long time and the RPA were really good with me. Um, but it was, it, it, it just is an example of, I suppose, of, uh, someone suffering in silence and I think this mental health week is important that people do you know sort of sp- speak to people uh, and try to understand what you know it's very different for it for everybody it can be someone with OCD it can someone with be you know, manic depressive it can be someone you know in a certain way you just don't know what's behind closed doors with people but no one knew when, when people heard about it they, no one knew and I just I just suffered in silence and I would I have to say the biggest thing about it was I was just so embarrassed to say anything to anyone. I don't mind now, but this is years later. Look, we're now, you know, this, you know. It's a when long did, time uh, ago. did have you publicly? When did you? Um, only, only uh, last year, yeah. end of last, last year. Last year. Yeah, yeah. How, how many? Because there was always a stigma, wasn't there? About men, uh, men, yeah. uh, you know, just suck it up and get on with it, sort of thing. Back yeah. then, wasn't it? Two thousand, two thousand and one, especially. Yeah. Oh, years. absolutely. Yeah. Um, especially in a rugby environment, very sort of macho environment. It's yeah. It's lost throwing fuel. How many players, you know, not players you played with necessarily, but around the world or, you know, even sort of yeah. maybe sort of second, third division players, have you kept tabs on from around that time that have actually revealed, look, you know, I, I had issues as well? Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is, you know, uh, when people, a few, you know, big name players, contacted me and have have spoken to me about their mental health issues and again i think the the underlying common denominator is one of embarrassment of one of never wanting to say anything um and 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 i think the biggest thing actually in the rugby environment is it is a macho environment it is dog eat dog it's a playground environment and you know, it would never you don't be want to show. You don't want to show, you weakness, show weakness or vulnerability, do you? you go out, yeah, you go out there on the pitch and you're a gladiator. You strap yourself up. You go out there and you do your best. And, and mental health is one thing is, God, I would, I would be so embarrassed to tell anyone. Tell anyone. And, and I think players now, in the way the world is, it's becoming more open and I think people are becoming more honest. And I believe, I believe the RPA, there's a massive hotline at the moment. There's a lot of players getting in touch who are struggling, you know.